think it's hard to draw a line between Francesca being a provocative person as a choice I'm going to provoke and simply being provocative by her nature. I think she had quite a vivid sense of being an actor in a drama. And that sense of being an actor in a drama gave her a skill in terms of, shall we say, organizing the drama, making it work. I think we represented a family which not only had two artists, myself and my wife Betty, but Betty and I share a, a markedly uh, aesthetic attitude towards life. Everything we see has a great deal of interest for us. And I think that made a, a, a great impact on our children. Visual things, what things looked like, what we saw, ideas about art were just kind of a constant subject of discussion and just a sort of general topic of interest for us. I couldn't live with somebody who didn't give making art the importance that I give it. I just would hate them. When she went off to boarding school, I had a little um, Japanese imitation of a Bowley camera, and I gave it to her. And by the end of that year, she was just on fire to do photography. I think I stepped back a little bit to give her space. And I think I stepped back because she was so good. Made my work look kind of stupid. Some people wouldn't be so happy to have their 17-year-old or 16-year-old, whatever it is, making these pictures, you know, by herself with this nude guy in the a studio someplace photographing him. The idea that art expresses yourself, or that yourself is what it's all about, uh, was really distant for both of us. And when we look at someone else's work, we don't look at, well, what is this telling us about that person? We're talking about, what does the work of art say? Forget the artist. She just, you know, emotionally fell apart. And I don't know why, but, uh, I, you know, maybe I've been an absolutely horrible mother. I can't, I can't go back and rewrite it. And I don't, I don't really think it's true. There is simply, on the part of a public, a an interest in, in, in the tragic story. Those things happen in movies. They don't happen in my life. I didn't think they ever would.
Betty and I came from quite different backgrounds. She came from a Russian Jewish background uh, near Boston, and I grew up in an ultra wasp background in New Hampshire. So my motto was a studio in my time. <laughs> Yeah, here, you and if, see the if red. you're over there, there's a little bit of that black brush mark that's I, I can, there. The things we had in common were not the things we came from, but the things that we uh, discovered and shared together. I really was interested in, in making functional objects. I wanted to be a potter and make useful functional objects that uh, would, would change society because if you have beautiful things to use, it, it changes the kind of person you are. I adored my junior high school art teacher. She was very beautiful. And I'd seen paintings in collections and stuff, but I never imagined there were, that there were actually people alive who could do that with a brush. When I first met Betty, I had a consciousness of myself as an artist, which was quite different from hers. So I think she tended to reject the art context that almost defined itself as, as not being about art, not being an artist. I think in retrospect, we were both somewhat isolated, not many friends, uh, a world that somehow didn't quite move with us. And I think we found that we shared. We shared an interest in art and it was profound. I'd had very little experience with girls. I'd been to an all-male prep school. My, my contacts with girls had been relatively few. And I think Betty, in some way, just astonished me. She was very exotic. She was a very exotic person. He was 18 and I was 20. He's this great, big, beautiful man, you know? I just... <laughs> and he liked me. And I always like people who like me. Don't you? This intense, romantic Jewish girl artist was like something I had never encountered before, I never imagined existed. I'm always interested in, in, in what George is going to say. I mean, we've, we have been, you know, married together for 54 years, living together for 56 or 7 years now. And um, I'm always interested in what he's going to say. The difference is very quiet. They look great, don't they? I think this looks very nice, don't you? You know, George's parents were, they were very supportive of us financially, but didn't really want him to marry someone who was Jewish. 
so I've, they were very unpleasant to the two of us for a long time. My father came to tea with us after we were married a few weeks and never set foot in our house again. My two brothers, one of his, who is now deceased, have never set foot in my house. So that gives you some idea of the seriousness of their disapprobation and their capacity to carry it for 50 years. started teaching at the University of Colorado. And we had a family. In the 50s, everybody had a family. To have a family was the norm. When I first knew Betty, she declared she was going to have five children. But she got over that, glad to say. I have no idea what I wanted from a family. I think I wanted to have the experience of being a mother. I mean, I was, you know, 23 years old. I, I wanted the experience of having the baby. But I didn't think about how, you know, what a huge responsibility it was. I mean, that sort of came to me when they handed me this child at the door of the hospital. And I suddenly realized, you know, what had I done? I would have to be, for the rest of my life, somebody's mother. I never decided to have children. We never decided to have children. Children are one of these uh, kind of gift calamities that occur. When Charlie was born, we didn't know what to call him. And we thought we were naming him something that wasn't a very ordinary name. And then when he went to kindergarten, you know, there were like five Charlies in his class. <laughs> so, so. It seems to me that you go ahead and have a second child because you've made so many mistakes with the first child. You need to have a second one because now you know how to, you know, how to do it better. So, Francesca and I started off this life on a, you know, on a little better footing. Um, and I wasn't so, uh, you know, so frightened. I mean, I was more relaxed with Francesca, okay. When I was in the fourth grade, we moved to a new house and the Woodmans lived across the back from us. I think they were um, a sort of a revelation in the sense of, uh, for one, having this house that is a piece of sculpture. Francesca was a couple of years younger than I was, um, but we just became buddies. I mean, she had this very strong sort of almost mythology or set of stories and characters, and so she shared those with us. I wanted to do my work, but I managed to do it um, around the children. I mean, obviously it'd be interesting for you to ask Charlie that question and what he remembers. Well, my mother worked at home in a studio behind her house, so it was very common daily at any time if you wanted to go talk to her, she would be back there working, and we would go see her. So that was almost an, an extension of the, the sort of domestic sphere. I have memories of being in the house and having Betty um, cooking while we were there. Um, but, but there was also a clear sense that Betty was a creative person with important work that she needed to get done. And then there was a constant flow of the work being made in the studios coming into the house. 
So we were always eating off the plates that Betty made and the house was filled with George's paintings. So these were, I mean, they're just part of the fabric of life. They grew up terrified to break a pot. <laughs> you can do lots of things, but don't break one of my pots, you know. <laughs> that was, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. When Charlie is seven years old, he came down with diabetes. And childhood diabetes is very serious. Untreated, it's fatal. It created a kind of family dynamic where there was all this attention and control on Charlie, whereas Francesca was much freer in her life. She didn't come home for supper, who cared, etc. cetera. So that, that was difficult for him growing up and difficult for us. And part of a situation that Francesca was at the edge of and, and aware of. At, at a certain point, Charlie, who was, I suppose, 10, suddenly <laughs> came to George and just attacked him. Why aren't you a dad like all the other dads? Why are you doing this? Why are you making paintings? Why don't you go to an office? You know, what are you doing? And so George decided he should go and talk to Charlie's fifth grade class about what he was doing. So, so George, George did that. I did it, and I thought it went pretty well, and I was pleased. But the dad the week after me was a jet pilot, and boy, <laughs> I couldn't compete with that. <laughs> you know. The way Francesca you know, answered that question when she was 70, seven or eight, you know, oh, little girl, are you going to be a potter like your mummy? And she looked up and said, don't you think one of those is enough in any family? So, you know. This is a piece of art that's going to be for the new uh, American Embassy in Beijing. And they've asked, uh, I think, 12 artists to do projects for this. We never expected to have a house in Italy. We sort of got there by accident. I think we had a very vivid sense of being a family in Italy and having to adjust together to living here. It's going to come to a tragic end if it breaks one of those pieces. When Charlie and Francesca were children, we were dragging him around, and, and we would sometimes think, we are simply inflicting so much on these children. And my parents were very disapproving, and Betty's also, that these kids would be yanked out of school. Every summer, we'd yank them out of school before the school session was over. Uh, for two years, we flung them into Italian schools. Whatever friendships they had, we were uh, interrupting. I think we felt maybe we, this was a little hard on our children. And uh, I think we fe maybe felt a little defensive about it. When we went to museums with our small children, they would be given a little notebook and sent on their way, and we would meet an hour later somewhere. And that way, uh, Betty and I could look at art without children around our necks. Francesca became very interested in drawing pictures or copying pictures of women in very fancy dresses. And he, she produced uh, a number, a number of very 
elaborately recorded pictures of uh, the young woman in a very elaborate dress. Our children. So on many, many occasions when, what should we do today? And there would be the voice over here, well, I have to fire my kill. Or I have to work on my painting. Don't you think that's true? I suppose. Well, Francesca, I think, reflected that in, in her work. I mean, I think, you know, there's just sort of the work ethic. You know about the work ethic? It's not much around these days, but it was very much around. It's around here right now. Our children learn that art is a very high priority, that it's got to be done. You don't mess around and you don't go off and do hobbies on Sunday or something like that. You make art. And I think they had a sense that this, this is serious business from an early age. And I think that made, made, made a big impression on our children. It just always seemed that art was sort of the center of things in some way. I mean, I think my mother has said to me before that she doesn't really practice a religion, that art is kind of the religion for her. It's very easy to see how the notion would have been planted in Charlie and Francesca's heads that the valuable thing to do with your life is to create art. I think Francesca always sort of held herself apart aloof, you one might say, from everybody. So it seemed to me that from a very early age, she was sort of precocious, self-determined, um, and, and special in a way which I might sort of consider myself other or different, but I would describe her as special, which had a kind of value associated to it that I didn't feel about my difference. Francesca was about ready to embark on junior high school in Boulder. And she was aware that her brother, Charles, was in conflict and not always happy to be around the home. And Francesca uh, decided to uh, extricate herself from the family situation. And instead of doing it by rebelling or running away, did it by going to a very nice boarding school. I keep thinking, you know, is it going to, you know, has it, is it going to look big enough? Is it just going to look busy? Is it going to be lost? Is it too busy? Have I got too, you know, because it's so big. And about when she went off to boarding school, Francesca said she wanted to do some photography. I had an extra camera. I gave her a couple of lessons, and, uh, and she went off to school, and she had a teacher who stimulated her enormously. The, the first round of photographs were, were very good. They, they were not, they didn't have the stamp of Francesca's work. They were rather conventional subjects, but they were done very well. And then the following year, there began to appear that kind of amazing imagery, which she was putting herself into and creating different kinds of situations. Francesca was a little bit older than I was, but um, uh, in some sense, we grew up together. Francesca had a slightly flirtatious manner in general. A certain kind of a playfulness, I guess, would be more to the point. Um, 
that seemed um, unusual. I did have a big crush on Francesca, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, she was, I suppose, 16 and I was 14. And um, she, was, she, was, she did not want to go to Italy with her parents that year. She had a boyfriend in Boulder uh, who was a good deal older than she. Anyway, Francesca was spending that summer with us. That summer, she was very interested in taking pictures and she was very actively taking them. We were enough in, in, in touch with what goes on in photography to know that Francesca's, her work was uh, amazing and wonderful. And uh, the fact that they were uh, nude pictures of herself, many of them, um, I think was just of no consequence to us. The nude is a, a long-standing subject in art, and I think we'd both been exposed to so much classical art that it seems in some way a fairly natural thing to deal with. On the other hand, I think Francesca was also interested in just sort of a, a liberating act of undressing herself. When I first saw her early self-portraits, I think I was surprised and confused at first. That's my dear little friend, and look what she's doing with her body. It, not to mention that they were nudes, and that that was pretty shocking to me. So they were a little scary to me. That was the time that I reached out to go and try and sort of renew the friendship with Francesca, and there wasn't much reciprocally there. Um, and I think she had a new role in life as an artist. And I wasn't a part of that world to be useful to her somehow. Francesca went to RISD, that was about 1975. She made photographs which she was very involved with and was putting a lot of energy into it. Her work was so formed that really nothing could impede on the outside. We met the first day of school. She came to me at the doorway of the dorm at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence and asked to borrow a pair of scissors. And I asked her what her name was. And she said very, 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 very slowly, Francesca. And she looked at me. And I said, it's not something shorter? She said, no, it's Francesca. And then she said, what's your name? And I said, Sloan. She said, what? And I said, Sloan. She said, Sloan. There was a real rock star quality to Francesca because she was so ambitious and so talented and so driven and so focused that you it, that it was shocking. She had this enormously sophisticated eye and and was incredibly original. She came with the idea that she was a photographer. Nearly everyone else that comes doesn't know what they're going to be yet. And they choose from the 19 different areas of study. She came knowing. She was a photographer and she didn't want to take 2D and 3D design classes. So she had some hideous moments in class and even the teachers would ask me to go and rescue her from running away from these classes. I think when she had been photographing herself for several years, we began to wonder if there was not a element of self-preoccupation here, which was a little excessive. But uh, sort of at the moment that came into our minds, we discovered she was, was photographing other people a great deal, 
and that the use of herself as a model had uh, considerably diminished, so th that anxiety was removed. She had a notoriety in the photography department for having amazing work. But she didn't have, you know, great recognition. The world didn't agree with, you know, her daddy uh, about her talent. I think it's interesting that her fellow students did and the, and the faculty. Her concepts were far beyond the level of the class. In fact, all of us thought that Francesca had a level of artistic ability and seriousness that the rest of us hadn't matured into yet. We're fading in. I love fading. Okay, pick it up. I think Francesca and George are, are much were much closer in terms of of uh, the craft of what they were doing that. Francesca didn't discuss this with me. Uh, she discussed it with George. I think she looked for his approval of what she was doing, perhaps more than she looked for mine. I think we always got along with Francesca. We didn't want any conflict with Francesca. I think we were in awe of Francesca. She was fun to be with. Sparkling. It's 24 feet 8 inches, and then it goes all the way up to the ceiling. I think it'll be fine. We'll see. When she was 17, she went to Italy for the year as part of the RISD program. Si, si deve immaginare questa bellissima ragazza con questi meravigliosi capelli biondi, con questa pelliccia perché era inverno, pelliccia nera, questo contrasto tra il giallo dei capelli oro, dei capelli e il nero era veramente bello. So Francesca, fine, she spends a year in Rome. She takes a lot of pictures. She takes wonderful pictures. Does she take a picture of a fountain in Rome? Does she take a picture of a cathedral in Rome? Or the Spanish steps? No. Non si deve immaginare Francesca come eh, una ragazza sognatrice. Francesca era una che sapeva e voleva esattamente quello che aveva nella testa. Cioè era veramente un, una ragazza con delle idee chiarissime. Nella testa di Francesca ogni scatto aveva un senso, ecco, come ripeto, lei era il suo progetto, c'erano sempre dei progetti, ecco, non faceva mai delle cose a caso. Last week when I did that other videotape, the electricity went out and I was so upset. I was so upset that I recorded right over it. And then last weekend I went to, to New York to see Daddy. And Fabina was there. Fabina had called and she called back. Lei era sempre esattamente come voleva essere, non si è mai nascosta. Eh, aveva un, un carattere molto, molto aperto, molto gentile, molto simpatico. Eh, però certamente le sue azioni erano azioni finalizzate su qualche cosa, sul fatto di, diciamo, lavorare 24 ore su 24. Voleva un rapporto da artista con la A maiuscola, nel senso che lei voleva lavorare, lei voleva far vedere le sue cose, lei voleva fare un libro, lei voleva esporre. Vicious, 
Francesca was a really intense person, and everything she felt was intense. And I think her relationships with women were intense, her relationships with men were intense, her relationship with herself, and you know, which then you know came out in her work, was enormously intense. Another, another step or so. Okay. Fall down through the dress. Fall down through the dress first. She had incessant sexual attempts. And it was a sad situation that it, it was something she did that didn't have an emotional meaning beyond the fact that it might have worked itself into a photograph a little bit, or she would almost play with the idea that it was important. Benjamin was important. Benjamin was a, a friend of hers. I think Benjamin was a man she saw herself being with in the manner that her mother and father were together. And she could see herself as she, she conceived her parents' relationship. What do you have for dinner tonight? I was thinking I'd go get something nice. It was absolutely Francesca Woodsman's first caring, caring love. I just remember her talking about him as her boyfriend. Maybe there were complicated moments and complicated discussions, but Francesca had those complications with everyone. Area. It better not come down. <laughs> okay. July 21st. Okay, so it's before the Olympics. Yes. That's great. It's going to mm -hmm. be amazing. It's kind of amazing, isn't yeah, it? It's thing? fantastic. Yeah. which we really did so that George could have some recognition, but it was very hard for him. And for me, uh, it, it, it worked in that I was in New York and the art world in New York became a little bit interested in uh, clay, and maybe this is going to be the next hot thing. We moved to New York in 1980. Francesca was a living in New York, and, uh, and she took it seriously. When she got out of art school, is she going to earn a living? What's she going to do? We must remember that 30 years ago, photography was not the hot ticket it was today. There were very, very few galleries. Not that many photographers uh, out there, not that much attention being devoted to photography. New York was a struggle for Francesca because 
She didn't fit. She didn't fit into any job. She worked hard to. Even typing, at one point she was trying to be a typist and type letters without errors or, she just was not interested in a clean sheet of paper. I think Francesca thought she was a very good artist. I think she felt she was very good. She'd done a very good body of work and she should have recognition for it. And she was, you know, she didn't feel like, oh, I'm just learning how and maybe in five years I'll have something to say. She thought she had something to say. She'd said it and, you know, why weren't people, people should be, you know, listening to it, looking at it. She was very ambitious. I, I came to stay with her once for a few days and um, I'd come, I was trying to show my work to some gallery and, as usual, I was discouraged about it and whatnot. And Francesca said to me at breakfast, how many phone calls are you gonna make today? You have to make one career-related phone call every day. That's what she told me. The idea of being in New York and working in the fashion industry was really appealing to Francesca. And because she had ideas that had something to do with fashion, that might be a fit for her. She got very excited about it. The struggle came from her wanting to continue to do her own work and having no venue to do it, no place to fit in the industry. In the um, uh, seven, late 70s and 80s, I was representing fashion photographers. So when I first met her, it was in the setting of a fashion studio. And Francesca was like a third assistant loading cameras. So here I am uh, uh, spending my life uh, addressing the ego of an Italian fashion photographer. Meanwhile, in the studio, here's one of the great photographers of the 20th century under everybody's nose. There wasn't a place for her in New York for what she was doing and how refined she was already as an artist. However, what she did was far ahead of the times. You take the Urban Outfitters catalog and start looking at how they photograph now, take a picture of Francesca's, put them next to each other, and you'll see that the industry has come around to her way of thinking. I always sort of felt like she had her skin inside out. You know, there weren't a lot of layers. There wasn't a lot of protection. Beyond that kind of open sexuality that she was evident, there, there was a, a, a lot of need in her. For years, she was in a relationship with a man who was not treating her very nicely. But Francesca was a demanding person. I'd have to say Benjamin loved her, and even if he broke up with her, he did it in such a fashion that he had not truly lost touch with her. And I always adored how he handled someone that was incredibly needy for the attention and the love. I think there was a point where, in her, in her personal life, she was uh, discouraged and demoralized, and she found that it, it made being, doing her work as an artist difficult. And there were a couple of months where she was pretty hard put to make art. And I remember her saying she wanted, that she should do something else. Maybe she could, raise horses or something totally improbable. And I remember Betty saying with some severity, let's just talk about doing something else. You don't know how to do anything else.
I looked at Francesca's photographs almost more as, as um, formally as what they were, rather than getting myself tied into knots over the subject matter. I mean, other people disagree with me, so uh, I feel that I don't see them as autobiographical. But I think, you know, in a way, I, all the art we make is in some ways autobiographical. It's about us. Francesca Woodman was not trying to disappear as a representation of her state of mind when she was hiding behind a scrap of wallpaper. It was her making a parallel. How would, how would it be to be that peeling paint or wallpaper? How does the human form relate to it? You put yourself in it. I feel that Francesca's photographs should be looked at for the photographs they are, and not looked at because they were made by uh, a person with a perhaps uh, unusual history. She didn't have a depression or a neurosis of that nature. I'd say she had a neurosis, but more of a committed, passionate one towards taking pictures, and then a very fragile interior. She's a fragile person, and it caused her to make beautiful pictures. No, I don't think either one of us thought, well, you know, this child is, is psychologically disturbed, she's depressed, she's what, what's going on? No, right? No, no. The pictures are pictures of a healthy person who's looking at a fragile interior. The pictures are results of keeping very busy, committed to art, and therefore I'd say her healthiest years. So taking the pictures were all healthy years. The process was a blast. A truck carrying flour overturned on the street, and flour was all over the place and which she filled up in a bucket and brought into her studio. Some people look at this and what she's doing here as, oh, it's about absence and it's about, uh, you know, it's, it's somehow painful. And I see what she's doing here. She had this idea. They got all this flour. She's, she did it and it worked. And she's thrilled, she's pleased. And that's, you know, that's Francesca. It's not about loss, it's about, look what I did. That's what art making is about, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, that's such a wonderful shape. Oh, really, please. She would be saddled with a great sense of her, of her accomplishments and her abilities, at the same time with a great sense of uh, it's not good enough, I'm not, uh, my work isn't what it should be, um, I'm not pushing ahead sufficiently. I think for Francesca a lot of it depended on how quickly she could equal her parents as an artist. And my guess is it wasn't fast enough for her. September 1980, she was very distressed. We said, well, you should try to see a therapist. I'm not sure the therapist took her seriously enough. Who knows what the story was. Um, she tried to commit suicide at her apartment. Dear Slow Plum, after three weeks and weeks and weeks of thinking about it, I finally managed to try to do away with myself as neatly and concisely as possible. 
I do have standards. And my life at this point is like very old coffee sediment, and I would rather die young, leaving various accomplishments, some work, my friendship with you, and some other artifacts intact, instead of pell-mell erasing all of these delicate things. We went over there and, you know, got the fire department, broke the door down, took her to the hospital. But then, you know, she appeared to be, to be better. After that first suicide attempt, she did call me. And I was clear that she was unhappy and had been for a while and uh, worried about her. And she said, I'm not taking pictures. And that was alarming. Someone who you'd spent so much time with taking pictures wasn't taking pictures. I think that one statement alarmed me more than anything else. We had a couple of months or so living in terror with her. And in the beginning, you know, when she first attempted suicide, you know, she, she wanted to do, that's what she wanted to do again. So she was first here, but just constantly, someone had to be constantly with her. She was clearly not well, very distressed, and uh, We seem to be able to do nothing particularly to help her. And, and um, I just think things unraveled. She came to my, my apartment uh, for a dinner party and there were half a dozen people and I just looked at this photograph and here are all of us kind of clowning for the camera and everybody sort of clustered together looking at the camera. And Francesca is leaning over the edge of the couch, away from the rest of the group, with this kind of haunted, sad face. Francesca was missing. We couldn't find her. So we were concerned. Okay, let's see. I mean, I had, she had, she called, she said she was not feeling very well again. The psychotherapist had thought that maybe it would help her to take some kind of antidepressant drug. She was taking it. She was feeling better. She decided with our approval that she would go and live in her own apartment again and not be here sort of under our constant eye. No, I mean, I, and, and, and she went home and, you know, I think what happened was she stopped taking the drugs got very depressed and just felt that her, as she wrote down, her, her life felt like a stale cup of coffee and it wasn't worth living, that was. She had a bad day. She had had hopes of getting this NEA grant, which may not be realistic hopes, but she had plenty of hopes. Well, she didn't know she didn't get it. Either. Well, she knew. She knew she, she found out it. she didn't get it, and she had a bicycle oh, stolen yeah, on the same day. Was no, it was just a crappy day. Francesca came over to babysit, and I knew that she was in a very withdrawn state. And I, more than once, I remember saying, "Are you okay?" And she said, "Oh yeah, I just am getting the flu." I called Bob Kushner, who's a painter friend of ours. He was sort of irritated that, you know, why were we sort of staying so on top of Francesca? No, she wasn't there. She'd been there, but she said she didn't feel well and she'd gone off.
I'll tell you what I think happened is that she left our house, tried to call a number of people, couldn't call, couldn't get through to people, tried and left a number of messages for the man she was seeing, couldn't reach him, and then according to George, came back to the building next to us, which was a public building, went up to the roof and jumped off. We got a telephone call from a psychotherapist. And the psychotherapist said, she's missed her appointment. I'm very worried about her. So this started a frantic search, which didn't yield anything until the police yielded something. Body taken to the morgue, no ID. And the reason it took so long was the, the face was not recognizable. And he identified her through her clothing. It became uh, very confusing in a situation rather like shock and rather like a second-rate grade B movie. This isn't real, you're in a movie. The cops are taking you to the morgue, et cetera, et cetera. Those things happen in movies. They don't happen in my life. I didn't think they ever would. You'd like to blame somebody. You'd like to blame yourself. You would like not to blame yourself, or you'd like to blame somebody who's, you know, being cruel to Francesca. But I just don't think you can do that. I think it might comfort you to do it for a few minutes, but I don't think you can do that. And I don't think either one of us can you know, go through life blaming ourselves. A few days after Francesca's death, I called Betty. I called to New York, and I'm, I don't know that I had ever spoken on the telephone to either of them. Um, but I, I called and Betty answered and I said, Betty, this is Patricia. And I cried and she cried. That, that was all we could, could say. She just said that Francesca killed herself. I think she may have said. Um, she may have said how. In any case, as I said, I had One of the chapters in my life is, is, is the loss of a person to whom I was greatly devoted. But I was greatly devoted to that person because of uh, characteristics which made her, in some respects, a fragile and vulnerable person. The characteristics which made Francesca a really fascinating and creative person was part of the price of being that person. You can look at it that there is a psychic risk in being an artist. And uh, it may well have made life more difficult for her. And if she had, as a child, been primarily interested in uh, the peer girls and, and what people were going to wear to the high school prom, uh, I would not have found her so interesting or been so attached to her. They're such terrible photographs. You'd know that Francesca hadn't taken them. Well, how did I deal with the guilt?
I tried to stay away from it. Because I think there's no way of dealing with it. So, I think George and I both dealt with it very differently. Again, we're very different people. Um, I just don't think I can, I don't think I can really go near it today. I tried to deal with the pain of it, but I don't think I, I go anywhere near the guilt of it. I'd been producing paintings for many years, and uh, had not really much success in uh, bringing them to the attention of the public. I was invited to be in an exhibition of, uh, of uh, 19 artists at the Guggenheim Museum. And for me, it was the, this is the important event in a career which then had gone on for 25 years or whatever, and Francesca killed herself five days before the opening. So at a, at a moment where I, I sort of felt that somehow this scattered life of mine was coming together to some focus, uh, it was all scattered back again. What happened to me was I, um, I stopped working. And then, you know, finally started again. So that's what happened to me. What do you do? What do you do when somebody dies? What do you do? How do you, you know, how, I, how do you go on living? How, what do you do? You still get up, you eat, you, you, you know, you're like you're yourself, and yet you're not yourself. A few months after she died, I found that I was, I was distracted and confused. I had a hard time concentrating. And I found that I could not concentrate enough to read anything. And this was kind of alarming. And then I discovered Emily Dickinson's poems. It was so short that I could comprehend them within the amount of attention I could focus. I did all 1,200 poems. Both Betty and I have learned for many years, like many artists, you don't sort of think, well, shall I go in my studio today? Or I really don't have any good ideas. Maybe tomorrow I'll have a better idea. You go in your studio. If you don't have any ideas, you sharpen pencils. If you sharpen pencils long enough, you get an idea. It seemed more evident to me that George was impacted and kind of I mean, physically sort of crushed in on himself and Pained. And his work in photography started after Francesca's death. Let's move the chair about six inches this way. I think my work changed quite dramatically after Francesca's before. death. It's, it's, it's a very complicated chapter for me, the shifting of my work. Uh, to, to a great interest in photography. I was an abstract artist for many years, so the, the transition to the figure don't move, don't Try to put was, it was pretty abrupt and uh, emotionally a certain violence to it. Stay still, please. I don't know that in any 
conscious way he feels that he's carrying on her work, but that his creation of photographs is in some senses reminiscent of some of Francesca's work. Thank you. That was good. How many roles did you get through today? I think the relationships of, of my photographs to Francesca's, there are important relationships, but I don't think it's that easy to pinpoint what they are. In some sense, George's photographs, which involve models and young women and so on, are, are photographs which work with a, with a, a kind of mise-en-scene that, that Francesca's photographs also worked with. Um, so I think there is a kind of uh, responsiveness between the two works, and the, the two bodies of work. I don't really remember what happened to my work after Francesca died. I think, I, I know, I mean, the first thing I did was just to keep my hands busy. I made a bunch of tiles uh, for the kitchen to go behind the, the sink or something. That's when I made the decision um, not to make the functional pots anymore and just sort of made the leap into things which weren't particularly functional. I think Betty is a tough person and I think that the, I think it was very tough and I think it made her in some ways more determined. She'd always thrown herself into her work and that, uh, and she's always pushed herself. Eventually, I simply in some way uh, was healed by the process of, of, of working. It's not hanging on the wall, it becomes the wall. So it goes from window to window. And, and I don't think it's a good idea to just leave the, the fabric edge. sort of take Francesca's ambition and try to create her career. It happened by itself. I don't know when this happened, but there was a certain point where suddenly it became big. And I think it was based on some outside writers coming in and, and you know, creating their um, impression of Francesca's work. I really feel frustrated when the tragedy it overweighs what you're looking at, rather than the brilliance of the photographs. And they're brilliant. You look at them, they look up to date. It's quite shocking that 30 or more years later, they look like they could be done today. There was a confidence and a bravura there that is inspiring. Among other things, I teach the senior thesis class at SVA in photography. There is never a year where I don't have a number of students that are absolutely obsessed with Francesca, you know, and I, and I feel like it's almost, you know, celebrity status. How could you know the value that these things were, I was buying for 20 bucks would be worth, you know, $20,000. And uh, as my kids were going through college, every time a tuition bill came due or something, I'd just sell another one because I had a big stack of them. It's pretty wonderful to have someone, you know, stop. There they are, they're looking at your work. And there they are, they're looking at Francesca's work. I think Francesca occupies a much larger place in the, the mental lives and, and the lives of my parents today than she does for me. Um, so they're much more concerned with her, her legacy, her reputation. A lot of the energy of the day is about Francesca. There's a lot in our lives that, that is about Francesca, and that's, of course, a way of, of keeping her there. 
Look at George, he has a butterfly in his hand. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Would you want one of yours? Yeah, maybe I'll give it to you. Right, there it goes. Oh, is that the guy that's on me? Yeah. Oh, you made it sound like this big butterfly. <laughs> well, here they are. There they are. As Francesca's work has become more and more well known, she's the famous artist, and we're the famous artist, you know, sort of family. And I think each of us, Charlie, George, and myself, have, you know, sort of had to deal with this, and we do it in different ways. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, sweetie. How are you? Well, there's a, an element of, of competitiveness in the family because we are all involved in the arts, and so it's possible in that way to compare one person's success to another's. You know, not to say that the work of one person is better than the other, but so, some members of the family have achieved more um, commercial success in the art world or fame in the world of exhibitions and museums. You know, Francesca's already done that and Betty's already done that and it, it, it somehow some, can make some things which I have accomplished which are significant seem like they're less um, significant than they are. You want it to... I think you have huge amount of pleasure uh, from her success. I mean, you know, we don't have Francesca, so this is what, what we have, and aren't we lucky to have it? And isn't it wonderful? But it's not always wonderful. I think it, at times it's, it really rubs you the wrong way. You know, hey, wait a minute. You know, I'm an artist too. Watch out. Well, there is a competitive dimension, and clearly uh, Francesca's work receives a great deal of attention. But I can think, well, I wouldn't mind a slightly larger slice of that cake myself. But I just accept that as a matter of fact. I think that the important issue is, does her work deserve it? And if her work didn't deserve it, then it would be a very big issue for me. I enjoy things which uh, Francesca did not get to enjoy. For example, I'm about to be 77, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the enjoyment of being 77 with its uh, complexity of perspectives and its uh, uh, rich background of experience. And uh, this is something which Francesca did not get to enjoy. So I may not be getting a great deal of attention, but uh, I think, I think to, to stay alive is so. Uh, it, it, it's a pretty good thing to do. I was very um, nervous and uh, not decide that they didn't really want to put this big thing in there in the American Embassy. It was a giant, it's a giant piece. It took me about a year um, to make it. It was a huge amount of work. A part of it was, you know, dealing with the scale and, and trying to understand the scale of the piece. It probably is the largest uh, work of art that they have in the embassy, but so I was nervous. <laughs> the piece has painted canvas and then um, wooden shelves and um, ceramic elements that are mounted on the painted canvas. The scale is just huge. Oh, 
it was pretty emotional walking in and seeing it. Oh, I'm, I was very pleased. I'm, you know. <laughs> it really yeah. looks great. It really looks great really because does. it looks so Chinese without looking, quote, Chinese. <laughs> and that's a very hard thing to achieve. <laughs> You know, you have you have your moments of thinking you're a genius, and your moments of thinking you're just a you know an utter failure. So no, this was a moment of thinking. You know, how could I have done anything that wonderful? It's pretty great. The most usual response to my work that you know, over and over and over again, I've gotten is people say. It made me feel good. Oh, I saw your show. It made me feel wonderful. I don't think my work is, a, in a sense, expresses the, in, in a very easy way to recognize the, the tragedy that's taken place in my life. Somehow, without my planning it this way, my work seems to be about making people um, feel better. I didn't intend to do this. I think somehow, um, maybe I want to make myself happy. Maybe that's why I'm doing it. One thing that's made us stick together is not that we just had ourselves to stick to, but we were at the same time sticking to being artists. We have found in our lives and our experience that the aesthetic, the experience of art, it's almost vulnerable in this world, but enormously rewarding, enormously important, enormously humanizing. I talk about this, this sense of memory in my work and the sense of memory in making art and that all art is, is for me about remembering and about memory. There's a little coffin. I'm afraid some poor child has departed. Go back. Retreat. Retreat. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up.